Hello, I'm David Mowry, author of Morgan's Great Raid, The Remarkable Expedition from Kentucky to Ohio, and the chair of the Buffington Island Battlefield Preservation Foundation. In this installment, we will answer the question, who was John Hunt Morgan? The handsome, dashing 38-year-old Brigadier General hailed from a prominent pro-Confederate family in Lexington, Kentucky. One Confederate soldier asked, did you ever see Morgan on horseback? If not, you missed one of the most impressive figures of the war. Perhaps no general in either army surpassed him in the striking proportion and grace of his person and the ease and grace of his horsemanship. At six feet tall, 185 pounds, broad-shouldered, with sparkling gray-blue eyes and a well-trimmed black beard and mustache, he was a compelling man to behold. John Hunt Morgan was born in 1825 in Huntsville, Alabama, to a family with ties to Kentucky millionaire John Wesley Hunt. Morgan grew up in the world of Southern High Society and its definition of honor. He briefly attended Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, but higher education did not suit him. He quit school in 1844 in search of a permanent commission in the United States Marine Corps. Although this opportunity never manifested itself, the advent of the Mexican-American War offered John the chance he needed to enter the military. In June 1846, Morgan volunteered as a private in Company K of Colonel Humphrey Marshall's 1st Regiment of Kentucky Mounted Volunteers and was subsequently promoted to 1st Lieutenant. John saw action in the Battle of Buena Vista in Mexico where the regiment handled itself well. When the war ended, Morgan again searched for a way to make military service a lasting occupation. Meanwhile, he ran several lucrative businesses that made him wealthy and well-respected in Lexington society. In 1857, John used his wealth to fund and train 60 men to form a militia company called the Lexington Rifles. This well-drilled military group became the toast of the city's southern aristocracy and became the core of what we know today as Morgan's Raiders. However, John Morgan also harbored a darker side to his personality. He frequently suffered bouts of depression that would affect him for weeks at a time. To counteract his melancholic fits, he often gambled, drank heavily, and enjoyed the company of loose women, all respectable acts in upper-class antebellum Southern society. His brother-in-law, Basil Duke, testified that Morgan never did anything that touched his integrity as a man and his honor as a gentleman. The qualities in General Morgan, which would have attracted most attention in private life, were an exceeding gentleness of disposition and unbounded generosity. His kindness and goodness of heart were proverbial. After his wife became so severely ill that she required continual care, Morgan delayed joining his comrades in the Civil War by four months so that he could stay by his wife's side. In the end, John Morgan was a good husband and a caring, honorable citizen. He understood his own flaws and he tolerated the faults of others, a characteristic found in good leadership. Morgan had already earned accolades for his daring thrust deep behind Union lines to disrupt enemy communications reinforcements and supplies. His targets were things, not armies. Morgan was a colleague of the brilliant Confederate cavalry leader Nathan Bedford Forrest, who thought that horses should be used as a mode of transport for infantrymen. Unlike the standard cavalrymen, who were armed with sabers and pistols, which were good only for hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the infantrymen possessed rifles and artillery firepower that could defeat opponents at long range. Forrest and Morgan shared the strategy that infantrymen mounted on horses were more maneuverable and thus more effective than the standard infantrymen who traveled on foot. Infantrymen mounted on horses had the necessary firepower, endurance, and quickness 
to capture enemy outposts protecting railroads, steamboats, and wagons, the key modes of transport for supplies and reinforcements. If the outposts could be disabled temporarily, then destruction of the enemy's support system could be accomplished. Such destruction would naturally hinder or completely stop the enemy in their ability to wage war at the front. This strategy is not unlike the modern-day tactics of the United States Special Operations Command, whose units include the Army's Delta Force and the Navy SEALs. We look forward to another installation of Discussion of Morgan's Great Ray by David Mowry. Thank you.